A couple months back, I made an hour-long video dissecting every single season of Big Mar, coming to the conclusion that the show was... pretty bad. But not terrible. With how much folks rant and rave about it online, I was shocked to see that I'd actually find myself liking some of the ideas they went with. Mainly manifesting one's hormones through a monster called... the Hormone Monster. It's a neat idea in the surface level, but pretty disappointing when you realize that the series literally never uses this fun concept to their advantage. Just having it as an excuse to tell cringy stories and show kids private parts without getting in trouble. It's not creepy if it's educational! One of the main things I hated about the series was how they started to introduce all these other creatures like love bugs, depression kitties, anxiety mosquitoes. It only aided in confusing this concept more and more given how they're introduced. Like, are we really expected to believe that a 13-year-old boy has never felt anxious before? Never got a bit tense trying to get that victory king, royale? Oh yeah, and then they confused it further by explaining how there's this... strange portal to another world where all of these emotional beast creatures live and work in an office building together. It's truly bizarre and only bricks any sense of logic this series once had. Like, I meant to believe that these creatures somehow are able to work with dozens of people at the same time somehow, despite also being their emotions? And on top of that, they have time to live a regular life outside of their 9 to 5? Well, I clearly have no taste, because in March of 2022, Netflix released their first spin-off to Big Mive, Human Resources. Maybe I'm just cynical, but it came off as such a lazy idea. Like, they saw the immense success of Big Mouth and thought that combining it with another crazy popular show would print money. In this case, it's literally like they pitched it through the prospects of Big Mouth meets The Office, of all things. So the show's gonna be like Big Mouth? Well, Big Mouth meets The Office is how we sold it. Oh, I'd watch that. Oh, great. I'm glad they spent the first minute of their show basically confirming how lazy of an idea this was. Saying all this, however... I watched the first two episodes when they were initially released, and I actually find myself not absolutely hating it. I remember there being a couple interesting and clever concepts buried underneath a cavalcade of problems. Funnily enough, like a month after I released my video where I kept reiterating how Big Mouth was here to stay along the likes of Family Guy and The Simpsons, it was announced that it would only be getting picked up for two more seasons, with the eighth being its final. An unfortunate death for Big Mouth enjoyers. And sadly, Netflix were taking human resources with it being cancelled after only two. How will we go on not finding out what happens to baby Nick Kroll? Guys, go to the description and sign my petition to get a new season. Big Mouth Future. That doesn't exist, don't actually do that. So given its ending, I figured now would be the perfect time to put the spotlight on human resources. I watched the whole thing. Pray for me. And what conclusion did I come to? Well, that's what you gotta watch the video for! R right now! Kill me! Human Resources Season 1 kicks off... Well, okay, after the funny epic meta moment... ...by introducing us to our main protagonist, Emmy. Yeah, I was shocked to see them have some restraint and not have Maurice be the main character. I'm glad they recognized he works best in small doses. No, instead, she's the bumbling, quirky assistant to another love bug who works at the office. If there's one way I could describe her character, it would have to be this image. She's lied and obnoxious, gets drunk all the time, just a total mess. But what oh Her boss has just been fired for undisclosed reasons, and so now she's gotta take over! Honestly, when hearing this premise, it sounded like a great idea for a show. No, really. You know, in a perfect world where Nick Kroll was competent, this would be a series that sees our main characters tackling a different human every episode, dealing with their emotions and helping them get through whatever problem they currently have going on in their life. You know, if you think that's what it's gonna be about, then you're right. Partially. See, if they did that, every episode could be something completely new. It allows you to cover a variety of different subject matters that could be relatable to adults. But no. Instead, the entire thing sees her being the love bug replacement for her boss's kiss, this lady who's just had a baby. So every single story following her doing her job has to do with this same lady, dealing with her husband and baby. The variety, instead, comes from the other creatures and who they're following. However, it's the same people every time. This guy who likes basketball. This old lady. There are certain episodes where they go into showing them overseeing new characters, and huh, what do you know? They end up being some of the most interesting out of the entire show. Like, there's this one where we follow a girl in high school who's going to the same college as her girlfriend. Only issue is she just got accepted into a better school. So now she's got to decide whether or not to follow her love bug or her... business... goblin... her sensible... something? 
Gonna be honest, I did not bother remembering her name. <laughs> It's bizarre because when I describe it, you can't help but wonder how they could fuck this up so bad. They had gold here with the premise to human resources. Every episode can mix and match different emotions together to see how they work off each other, to end on delivering some profound message about the way people think and how their feelings can either clash or harmonize. But they never really execute upon this. They're more interested in using this setup as a jumping ground for their hilarious jokes. Follow me on TikTok. You are on TikTok? Yeah, I invented a dance called the Leaky Diaper. I have two likes. That's also not to mention we spend just as much time in the monster world, which defeats the whole fucking purpose and only confuses things tenfold. They don't even bother trying to explain how the rules work here. They knew it made no sense. Again, it bears repeating because this is the grind work to your show. How is a monster supposed to deal with a person's single emotion, be ready to be called upon at a second's notice, but somehow works a 9 to 5 and still has time to go back to their office to do monster paperwork and stuff, while doing all that for multiple people at the same time? Why would God do this? Most episodes not only have an A story, but also a B story and a C story. And because of this, none of them are allowed to be fleshed out that much because the writers want to cram in as many creatures into these 10 episodes as feasibly possible. They expect you to treat this like it's The Office. They expect you to care about every single one of these monsters and what they've got going on in their life. If anything, I'd argue they spend more time on their workplace shenanigans compared to their infinitely more interesting job. Oh wow. The rock guy has fallen in love with love bug number three, but she's dating another guy. Wait a second, is that guy? But that's Emmy's old boyfriend. How is she gonna react to this? Boy, I sure can't wait for this riveting payoff. Like, I genuinely think that's how the writers expect you to react to this shit. They bring back all your favorite Big Mouth characters like... Mori. Girl hormone monster. Connie, I think? Depression kitty and the Sheem Wizard, all back again to do the exact same things they did in Big Mouth. See, it's kind of hard to have a show focusing on any one of these guys when you know how they're going to react to every situation. The Depression Kitty wants to make Emmy's client depressed? Who could have guessed? The Hormone Monster talks about dick and sex. Really brick a new grind there, aren't we? They become so desperate to recapture the lightning in a bottle that was Big Mouth, that for an episode they literally just have Andrew come back to make the same jokes he makes in Big Mouth. I get it, he jerks off. I just don't see what the point in this show was. I'd get it if this was like a sequel series or something, but no, they're running concurrently. There are plot threads set up in human resources that you have to watch Big Mouth for to get the payoff, and vice versa. For example, in Big Mouth, one of the fucking seasons, I don't know, I'm not watching it again, Maury is randomly pregnant all of a sudden. I guess people really need to watch the spin-off? Yeah, they watched it. You, you didn't watch it? I can't watch shows with my friends in them. It just takes me right out. So that's fine, I guess. He's just now pregnant. But he gives birth to the baby on Big Mouth, not human resources. I hope you like both of these shows, because if you want to follow along with the plot, you gotta watch both shows in order. But I guess fuck me for caring about the plot of Big Mouth. That was my mistake. It all comes off as a desperate attempt to force viewers into watching both shows. Evidently, the attempt did not work. And speaking of not working, it's so, so ugly. I don't know how they managed to make it look worse than Big Mouth. These new monster designs, while fine in certain places, I actually like the Logic Rock guy a ton. He's probably the best character in the entire Big Mouth franchise. But we have others who are just hideous like... Oh, what's her fucking name? Like the other show that I've said the name of too many times, the only moment where they ever try to get ambitious with the animation is during their musical numbers, which are just as disturbing and gross as said unmentionable previous show. I'm afraid if I say it again, Nick Kroll's gonna come out of my mirror and do stand-up comedy for me. Like, I didn't need to see up-close shots of a woman's nipples singing while covered in sores and cuts from her baby biting it. It's terrible. Somehow not as disgusting as Big Buzz. Oh, fuck! I'm being very mean today, I recognize that. I apologize, it's just I spent my entire day watching fucking human resources. Okay. Is there anything I like about the show? No. That's a joke, okay, for real this time. There is actually one subplot in Human Resources that I like a lot, and it's the only one that I feel like fully executed the grit potential for the series. We're introduced to this old lady living in an old folks home. Emmy is mentoring this guy love bug to realize what it truly means to feel love or some junk. We see them escape into her memories, revisiting all these special times in her life, before everything starts to crumble apart and it's revealed that she has Alzheimer's. They're able to visualize her mind collapsing the second her immersion is ruined with her freaking out and not recognizing her son. It's really strong and well done. Emmy learning how fine a line there is between love and hate. The meal love bug didn't remember the name. 
Seeing Hai overindulging in this love for her past memories can actually be a bad thing. I wasn't expecting them to bring her back, but they do towards the end of the season. With her granddaughter, who was actually the trans kid from the summer camp season of Big Mouth, taking a ride in an adventure. The love bug slowly realizing that she's dying and he's not ready for that. He wants to keep reliving these memories till the end of time. They even pull in her son having to deal with Keith grief, played by Henry Winkler. Him having to accept that his mother won't be around for much longer and he has to process that before it's too late. They actually had the balls to end it with her dying, and it's one of the only moments in the entire season where they set something up and gave it a satisfying payoff. Kinda loses me in the last couple minutes when the granddaughter can suddenly see the love bug and he becomes hers now. Like we had a full plot in that season of Big Mouth of her being in love with Seth Rogen. That is not a joke. But why wouldn't she have a love bug then? But then again, who cares? I also really enjoy when they finally reveal in episode 8 why the previous love bug Emmy was the assistant for got fired. And it's because she fell in love with a human who could actually see her. Doesn't make a ton of sense considering we're meant to believe this human somehow didn't have any emotion creatures of her own, but hey, I don't mind them bending the rules when they actually do something with it. We see their bond growing more and more, Sonya getting ready to quit her job as a love bug to go be with her, before realizing that the reason the lady was able to see her was because she was schizophrenic. Sonya realizing how crazy this all is, and that being with her will only cause her mental illness to worsen, and so she lets her go. Huh. It's funny, it's almost like your audience connects with your characters more when you try to be earnest. Interesting. But did you also know that this is a Netflix show? You've got two shows on Netflix! The meta humor has unfortunately not subsided with this new series, and it's taken me until very recently to realize why this stuff bothers me so much. It's lazy. Where's Walter? Oh, Walter's part of the A story this episode. The problem with these jokes aren't that they're meta, it's that they're easy. It feels like a cheap laugh. Like you don't have to put any effort into your writing because the average person finds this shit hilarious. I recently watched this other Netflix animated series, Tear Across the Dotted Line, which was very good, I want to discuss it at some point in the future, but the series is super personal to the creator. He narrates the whole thing and voices all the characters. A couple weeks it returned for a sequel series, This World Can't Tear Me Down. And not as good, but still solid. But something I noticed is that it's incredibly meta and self-referential. They make these exact same Netflix jokes, but somehow it works. Please excuse me, I'm going to do an interview with Cosmopolitan and make a series for Netflix. Blessed are ye who are in line for benefits. That's when I realized it's all about execution and purpose. In terror because the story is so personal, we're seeing the main character, you know, the author, creating a season about some of the troubles that were going on when it came to Italy and immigration, him being very pro-immigrants. But there's a lot of moments in the show where we see him stop and try to ask if he's even allowed to vocalize an opinion on the matter, because look at him. He's trying to relate and speak for the common man when he's not the common man. He's literally a famous cartoonist and is doing this from within his own Netflix series. It's very meta, they say the word Netflix like 20 times an episode. But it works because of the context. The meta commentary is used as a jumping grind for a discussion, instead of the entire joke just being, lol, Netflix is something you watch. It's safe to say season 1 of Human Resources left a lot to be desired, with its main issue being that it doesn't execute upon this idea very well at all. But I will say, there is a glimmer of hope for season 2 with it ending on Emmy getting a boatload of new clients to become a love bug for. So before definitively saying it's a bad show, it's probably worth giving it a chance to prove itself. So let's go, human resources. Wow me. Holy shit, is that a Sonic reference? I just find them to be cringe. Cringe? Cringe. Cringe? Yeah, it's just cringe. Oh boy, here we go. Back at it again with Human Resources Season 2. I, I, wait a minute, I, I think I actually like this one. What the hell? Season 2 begins the only way it could, giving us a literal slideshow of what happened in Big Mive to explain why the hormone monsters had their baby off screen. I think it's a perfect way to catch people up from last season. Glad to see they still haven't lost their wit. Yeah, just gonna get it out of the way now. This show is still insanely unfunny. Sometimes characters have twins, and that's just good storytelling. I forgot to mention it last season, but there are these random moments where they're clearly trying to have visual humor, but it's so infrequent that it confuses me every time it comes on. Like, this is a show about dicks and sex. Why are you also trying to be Monsters, Inc.? Now, where this season really starts to improve is with the characters. They start to get way more fleshed out to the point where you actually <gasps> care about them. We kind of drop Emmy getting a bunch of new clients to instead focus on one again. 
but it's not as big of an issue, because we're also introduced to a bunch of new clans for the other creatures to be around. Like this lady, this guy, and this kid. All memorable characters. Yes, I remember their names. Why are you stupid? Why are you even asking this? First of all, I gotta talk about our few new characters for the season to take the place of Gavin. Wait, who's Gavin? Oh, oh, that's right. Half of these characters are so utterly forgettable that I forgot to mention him at all. Hormone monster, this guy, very cocky, pun was unintentional. Oh yeah, he dies near the end, fell off a building, was very emotional, promise. So anyways, in terms of new major characters, we have Hope, who I find kind of annoying, but I also think that's the point. As well as this female logic rock lady. It took me way too long to realize that she was voiced by Miley Cyrus. I think the writers might have worried about that, so thankfully, they came prepared. Remember when you were a kid and I knew that Miley and Hannah Montana were the same person? You did. I still can't believe it. In this same episode, we see a poster on the wall that is literally just a trace of Invader Zim. There is not even an attempt at parry here. So during this season, we see the Logic Rock fella pursuing the love bug Rochelle, after that purple guy from last season breaks up with her, which begins turning her into a hit snake. I think they really wanted you to root for them like Jim and Pam from The Office, but I could not give less of a shit about her. I don't know why they treat it like she's the main character all of a sudden. A majority of these episodes are about her, she even gets to start the final song. Now while I wasn't a fan of these office escapades, I ended up really enjoying what they had going on in the human world. They were able to cover a lot of different grind while still finding a way to connect everything together. It feels way more in line with how I thought Season 1 was going to be, with us seeing these people deal with their problems with two of their emotion creatures being at odds with one another. First of all, we got this lady, Emmy's new client. That's where she meets Miley S... M Miley Stone Sis? Miley... M Miley Rock Sis. We see how Miley is continuously pushing her away from people, not allowing her to get too close to others. It's this big running theme throughout the whole season until Emmy goes inside her memory bank, which is a thing now. Hey, is that in my head too? Shit, I don't know all the rules! Well, at least they're finally admitting it. But she finds out that her client had a super close relationship with her mother, but when she got cancer and was suffering in hospital, they didn't want to face it and chose to ignore her, never seeing her mom until one day getting the news that she died. On the other hand, we follow along our meal love bug. I'm so sorry, I could just Google the names, but I really don't want to. We see him helping an old man who's just lost his wife. He kinda has to learn the exact same thing as last season, to stop holding on to past memories and to move forward. But they also throw in a great message of the man finally needing to discover more about himself now that his wife is gone, and so he starts trying to branch out and find a partner again. This is when Emmy's client sees the old man on a date with another woman, and it's revealed that she's his daughter! Whoa! I was somehow not expecting that. Now both of these disparate plot threads have started to intertwine, and we begin to see the way in which both of these creatures have been helping their clients start to clash. The daughter not being able to handle that her dad is finally moving on and letting others in. On top of that, we've also got this lady who's an acclaimed offer but can't seem to find people she can connect with. People either treating her differently for her disability, or simply trying to use her as a stepping stool to move higher up in their industry. It follows through really well with another great episode, where we follow a boy who's got a disability that prevents him from speaking, yet he wants a toy truck, and so we see the creatures trying to find a way for him to communicate to his parents. Now, the same author lady has been advocating for this kid the whole season, because of the way his school has been mistreating him because of his disability, but when he finally does begin to communicate with his parents and they appraise him for it, she starts to worry that it'll just be a repeat of what happened with her mother. That because he was able to overcome his disability, they'll start expecting stuff from him that he just simply can't accomplish, which results in her blowing up at the parents, telling them to stop praising him. It's such a tonal whiplash compared to last season to see the writers actually managing to allow scenes to play out, with no fear of needing wacky sex jokes every 10 seconds. Now don't worry, Hormone Monster fans, there is just as much Hormone Monster goodness as before, although now with the addition of a kid character because that always works. It's mainly just your average plots you'd expect from there being a kid now, who can also somehow rapidly age. Oh, they're playing sports together, but the kid is better than the adults. Oh no, he doesn't want to follow the family business of being a hormone monster. He wants to be a shame wizard. What college is he gonna go to? That shit. You know, at least when I have my expectations for these characters so low already, I can just kind of tune these scenes out and turn my brain off. It's only unfortunate because there are so many episodes in the season that have almost nothing to do with their job, especially near the end of the season. We have an entire episode where this little germ guy is being spread around the office and they all get sick. The monsters are having a party and realize the Shame Wizard isn't that bad of a guy after all. The final episode of the entire series leaves a pretty bad taste in my mouth because it's just one big Die Hard parody. And you can't have a Die Hard parody without the characters constantly pointing out that what they're experiencing is similar to that movie Die Hard. 
This idea is so lazy that Rick and Morty literally did the exact same thing with the exact same jokes years ago, and it was equally as unfunny. There are still glimmers of hope, however, sprinkled beneath. Like the germ episode is where we finally learn more about Miley Cyrus's character, and I like it a lot. We learn that she's so closed off from others because she fears attachment. She lives forever and therefore has to witness countless clients of hers die, and it's turned her into, well, stone. It's times like this where I can actually see the people behind this show having an idea. And it comes together to create a season that, well, yeah, is a little messy and nowhere near amusing or anything, but it's solid. I enjoyed my time with it. If you want my advice, if you ever find yourself interested in checking this series out for whatever reason, start with the second season, you'll have a much more pleasant time. It actually left me feeling kind of bad that the series ended here, when it felt like they had just started finding their groove. Who knows, maybe if this series went on for another eight seasons like Big Mouth, people would be praising its positive aspects a lot more. But then that just begs the question. If this show is infinitely better than Big Mouth, why did it feel? And I think the answer mainly has to lie with the audience. See, Big Mouth is in a very fortunate place I like to call riding the line. Sure, it's a show for adults that focuses on awkward moments from your childhood that anyone could relate to, like fucking your pillow and getting it pregnant. You know, it's something for adults to watch and reminisce about, not to mention laugh at all the funny pee-pee poo-poo jokes. But, if I were to take a guess, I'd have to say a majority of Big Mouth's audience are probably under 18. The people who are currently going through the stuff the series is poking fun at. You know, it's more relatable. Well, not to mention also laugh at all the funny pee-pee poo-poo jokes. Kids want to watch a show for adults that still appeals to their younger sense of humor, and adults want to revel in a bit of absurdity every now and then, as levity from their terrible adult lives. You know, it's like if Family Guy created their Cleveland show spinoff, but instead of it just being Family Guy, again, it was a workplace comedy where every episode we see some story revolving around Cleveland. What was his job in that show? A cable TV installer? I'm enthralled. This shit isn't appealing to kids, and I can't imagine the adults market was large enough to warrant another season. Even still, though, human resources is pretty alright. I'm just glad we're approaching the end of Nick Kroll's Reign of Terror. No, I'm not making a video on Big Mouth Season 7 and 8. What are you, crazy? <laughs> no, that would be... That would just be absurd. I, I couldn't do that to myself. <laughs> Help me.